Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And I'm glad that you're here this evening for the study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we're continuing in our reading of A.T. Jones' 1893 General Conference Bulletins. And, and these have been a real blessing at this point. Uh, we're getting near the end. We got a few more of his articles, his sermons that he presented there. And um, uh, some of these ideas uh, tie back to uh, the concepts that he presented at the beginning of the series and in things that we have been discussing and studying. So can you begin me, uh, can we begin this meeting and join me with in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath and for each person who who is watching or participating in these studies. We just ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to speak to us. We need your presence. We are thankful for the Sabbath day and the blessing that it is. And as we study on this topic, we ask, Lord, that um, we can experience your presence in a special way. Bless each person. We will help them in the struggles that they face. And may this Sabbath truly be a day of rest and refreshment spiritually uh, that we can receive um, the blessing of the Sabbath as it is meant to be experienced, that we can rest in Christ not just rest physically, uh, but that we can rest from our labors. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. So um, in this study, Jones is going to continue where he had left off in study 20, and he's going to be addressing um the depth of the Sabbath, the significance of the Sabbath. So we'll just start reading and then we can, if people have questions or they want to make comments, feel free to do so. Some people like to just put comments in the chat. Um, but uh, I'm going to be reading a lot. And so we need to break it up once in a while because it might be a bit monotonous hearing my voice all the time, but uh, we'll, we'll take up the reading now. It says, we take up the thought tonight, just where it was left last night, that the work of God in salvation is the same as the work of God in carrying out his original purpose in creation. Because as stated then, at the time the creation of the heavens and the earth was finished, and all the host of them, God completed God's completed purpose stood there, in which he took delight in that day. Yet through the deception of Satan, this world was swung clear out of his creative purpose and turned to the opposite. So this idea that Jones is expressing is something that uh, we have been doing in our uh, Friday afternoon studies with people here in the building, uh, looking at the creation in Genesis chapter one. And and showing that the days of creation mark the way marks in a reform line, and that what happens in creation also happens in recreation, and that our lines, uh, all the stories of the Bible, or the everlasting gospel, our three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, so that, uh, which is the everlasting gospel, is demonstrated in the creation of the world. And of course, this is really about God's recreation of the image of God in man. So Jones is expressing this idea. And um, so God completes his purpose in creating this, the heavens and the earth um, in six days. And we also know that on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, that Christ is going to say it is finished and yield up uh, the ghost, right? He's going to die. And, and we also know that 
that that work is going to be finished again at the end of the world, the recreation. So, so understanding the Sabbath, that's what Jones is addressing. And he's been addressing that for a while, comparing um, like he does in one of his pamphlets, basically uh, the papal Sabbath um, or the Christian Sabbath, as it's sometimes called, uh, uh, we have. So the Christian Sabbath is the papal Sabbath and the Jewish Sabbath and the Sabbath of the Lord. And so he's really looking here at the Sabbath of the Lord. Therefore, in order to complete his purpose, he has to gather from this world a people who will fill the earth when made new as it would have been filled if it had never fallen in his original purpose. And when that is accomplished through his this word of salvation, the power of God in salvation, that will be that will be the real finishing, indeed, the real accomplishment of his original purpose in making this world with all things a complete universe. When everything that is in heaven and earth, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that in them are saying blessing and honor and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And therefore the savior, when he was here said, my father worketh hitherto and I work. God's work was finished when the seventh day began of old, he rested. But his work on this earth and forming man here was undone so that he had to set to work again in the work of salvation to complete his original purpose. And therefore, Jesus says, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now, I will read three passages in the Old Testament and three in the New, and you can multiply on them just as far as you please, especially from the 40th chapter of Isaiah and onward, showing that in the work of salvation, he puts his original work in creation and himself as creator and his power as manifested in creation as the basis of our confidence in his power to accomplish our salvation. Uh, turn first to Psalm 111, verse 4. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The revised version, the Hebrew, Jewish, and others give it. He hath made a memorial for his wondrous works. That is what we have been talking about. That is the first part of the verse. And now the latter part, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. His wonderful works then that are signified in the memorial, which he has established, are attached right there in that verse to his graciousness, his fullness of compassion for man in this world who needs it so much. Now, the 40th chapter of Isaiah, and you can follow on through then, clear through the rest of the book of Isaiah, and you will see it all the way through. I will begin with the first verse, which is, you remember, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Of course, we see there the doubling. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. The margin reads, speak ye to the heart of Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That is the message of John the Baptist. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth but the word of our God shall stand forever. And Peter, quoting that text in the next two verses of the first chapter of 1 Peter, in the last two verses of the first chapter of 1 Peter says, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. He is quoting this from Isaiah, that the word of our God shall stand forever. And he says, 
This is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Then Isaiah goes right on and speaks in other words of the gospel. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Now that is the gospel. Up to that point, he is teaching the gospel by the word of God. Now read, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who did that? The same one who comes and says, I will tenderly lead like a shepherd. Those who are mine, the same whose word now speaks to us in the gospel and liveth forever. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him and taught him the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn or the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing. And vanity, to whom then will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Then skip to verse 25. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number, he calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Not one gets away, not one faileth. The text is, they are all kept. But what keeps them in place? Congregation, the power of his word. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now he tells us to look up and see who created all these things and bringeth out their host by number. He bringeth out their host. How? Congregation. By number. Well then, what is that for? Now then, the 27th verse. Why saith thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and uh, <clears throat> my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Look up to the heavens and see who made all these things. And he calls out the host by number, and not one fa fails. Now, Jacob, why are you saying that God hath forgotten you? What do you get discouraged for? What do you think he has forgotten you for? Why, he does not forget any of the planets in the universe. He knows them all by their names. Is he going to forget your name? What are these two things put there together for? Voice, for our comfort. Because the same one who created all these things is the one who comforted Israel. The one who knows all these things is the one that gives you and me our new name. Now, in the 28th, 28th verse. Um, now, when I'm reading through this, a whole bunch of these are scripture songs. Um, this one is. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Who does it? Congregation, the Lord. Well, lift up your eyes and see who created all these things. And then that he has power to give to the faint. He has power for the faint by his word. So he says... Be of good cheer, be of good courage. It is so. For when he spoke to Daniel, be strong, Daniel said, I am strong, for thou hast strengthened me. Now, the remainder of the chapter, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. 
But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Because the power that keeps the planet in their courses and in one place, that same power will be with the weak and the faint. And so they can run and not be weary. They can walk and not faint. Then don't you see that the Lord puts the creation and his power in creation there as the foundation of our hope in his salvation, then isn't it all one? Another blessed verse that touches so intimately everybody, I read in, I read it principally for that purpose, is found in the 147th Psalm, uh, third and fourth verses. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Then the one who can tell the number of the stars, calls them all by their names, is he who binds up and heals the broken hearts, binds up their wounds. Well then, have you been wounded in spirit, broken hearted, and almost in despair, and thought everything and everybody had forgotten you? I just remember the very next verse. The thought connected with it is, he not, not only healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds, but he tells the number of the stars and calls them all by their names, and he will not forget your name. That is the Lord. That is our Savior. But the foundation of our confidence in him as Savior is that he created all these things and knows all their names and holds them up by the word of his power, which saves. Now, reading hurriedly in the New Testament, you remember that scripture in the first chapter of John um, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in the 14th verse, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Then that one who created all things came here himself, full of grace and truth, flesh like ourselves, and through him we are partakers of his fullness. Don't you see then that the only thought that God would have us have about salvation is that he who creates, created us saves us, that the power by which he created is the power by which he saves, and the means by which he created his word, that means is the very one by which he saves, and this was his word. Unto you is the word of salvation sent. Now in Ephesians 3 speaks of the gospel beginning with the seventh verse and ending with the twelfth. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace, this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, what was he to preach? The unsearchable riches of Christ and to make men see what is the mystery that is in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Then the gospel is to bring men to understand God's purpose when he started out to create in the first place. Then, if the gospel were engaged in any other work and teaching any other thing or any other power than that original creation, don't you see the preaching of it would not bring them to that? But that being the design of it, that simply shows the force that is before us always. That God's purpose in the gospel is to make known to men who have lost the knowledge of it, the knowledge of his original purpose in creating all things in Jesus Christ. So we read on. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places 
might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we read in another place that he purposed that before the world began, he would have to if it was an eternal purpose. Then in Christ, in the salvation of this world and men, and the working of Christ in it, God is carrying out his eternal purpose that he began at the beginning, in whom, in Christ, we have boldness and confidence by the faith of him. Let us read the eternal purpose again. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In that original creating purpose that we spoke of last night, that was in Christ, this carrying out of it that was frustrated, um, this carrying out that was frustrated is Christ. Then it was Christ back there, and it is Christ now. It is Christ all the time, and the power of God in Christ all the way. The power of God manifested in the word all the way for the accomplishment of his purpose at the beginning and the accomplishment of that purpose at the close. Satan came in and swung the world off in a crooked way. And the Lord says, all right, we will carry it out that way. And Satan didn't do anything. He swung the world off, and so it has gone on, as it were, in a little byway. And God will carry the thing through in that byway and accomplish his eternal purpose so that it will astonish the universe and destroy the devil. It will do it. The same thing is in Colossians 1, beginning in the ninth verse. I will read hurriedly from the ninth to the 17th verse. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being faithful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Creation, salvation, the blessing of God, and his grace, and deliverance from the power of darkness. Also, it is all one story, the creative power of God, and God in Jesus Christ. First chapter of Hebrews has it all through. Well, it is all through the Bible. Now, then the thought. We do not need to dwell any further upon the thought that salvation is creation and is given as a sign signifying the creative power manifested in Jesus Christ. The only way that the power is manifested at all is in Jesus Christ. The only way we can know God is in him. Now, he has set up that sign to signify the creative power of God in Jesus Christ, and whether that creative power be in the original creation or in the work of salvation to carry out that original purpose in creation, it is all the same power, the same purpose, by the same one, in the same way, by the same means, and the same sign signifying all in all, in all its bearings and workings. <clears throat> Now then, if you have another sign set up to signify the work of salvation, another sign than that which God has set up, will that other sign signify the power of God and the salvation that is expected? 
The congregation answers, of course, correctly, no. Now think carefully of this. God set up a sign to signify his power, working everywhere and in every way in Christ Jesus. If you or anybody else sets up another sign, it cannot signify the power of God because it is some other one than God that sets it up. Then it is impossible to signify the power of God by another thing, another sign. That is impossible. Is it so? The congregation says yes. Further, if anybody should find anywhere in history another thing set up to signify salvation, it would signify salvation by another power than the power of God in Jesus Christ. It would have to do it. Well, has there been any effort, any pretense ever made in history by any other power to save people apart from Jesus Christ? Congregation, yes. Has there not arisen in the world a power called Antichrist? Congregation, yes. Anti is against or opposed to Christ. That power does propose to save people, doesn't it? Congregation, yes. Let us read the description of what it does in the first place. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Daniel 8, 25 also says, He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. He shall stand up to reign, to rule, to show forth his power against, opposed to the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? Congregation to Christ. He stands up against him. He will, he will reign. He will exercise his power, manifest his work in opposition to Christ. Take the 11th verse. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. But the margin reads, he magnified himself against the prince of the host of heaven. Because the previous verse shows it is the host of heaven. Then as Paul says, he exalted himself, opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped magnified himself, exalted himself against the prince of the host. What power is that, congregation? Papacy. That power is the papacy, the church, the Catholic church, the church of Rome. Now, is it not the doctrine of that church that there is no salvation anywhere else? Congregation, yes. Or by any means than that, than that church? Isn't that settled? Congregation, yes. Further, that church, that power opposed to Christ, that exalts and sets up itself as the way of salvation, is itself opposed to Christ. And yet that church says there is no other way of salvation. Then is it not plain that if it is going to have any sign to signify its power to save, it has got to have another one, um, another one than the Sabbath that is settled. Now, then another thought, as it must be a sign other than the Sabbath, which is the sign of the power of God in Jesus Christ and salvation, that any other power setting up a sign to show and signify its power unto salvation, would it not have to be in the nature of things a rival Sabbath? It would have to be that. There's no room for anything else. If they would set up anything else as a sign, the sign that God has set up, would stand alone and distinct in the world, and it would take precedence of it, and there would be no rivalry at all. Therefore, to make the rivalry complete and to make his power manifest in opposition to Christ, the man of sin has to have a sign of his power unto salvation, and it must be in the nature of things a rival to the sign, which is the sign of the salvation of Christ. It has to be that. And the Church of Rome makes no pretense of anything else. It makes no pretense of anything else than that the Sunday, which it is set up as is the sign of the power of the Church to command men under sin into the way of salvation. That is settled. That is the object of it. That is all it has started out to do, and that is all it did. Now, when the Sunday was set up and enforced upon the people by the power of earthly government, it made the practical living papacy as it exists in the world. And when it was done, Sunday was put in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord by direct and definite purpose that was done. 
Here's the record. This is said by one of the men who did it. On page 313 of Two Republics, that's one of Joan's books, we read as follows. All things whatsoever that it was duty to do on the Sabbath, these we have transferred to the Lord's Day. And that's from Eusebius. Uh, then the law was there to enforce the observance of Sunday. And what was the purpose of that? From the Two Republics, page 315, I read, Our emperor, ever beloved by him, who derives the source of imperial authority from above and is strong in the power of his sacred title, has controlled the empire of the world for a long period of years. Again, that preserver of the universe orders these heavens and earth and celestial kingdom consistently with his father's will. Even so, our emperor, whom he loves, by bringing those whom he rules on earth to the only begotten word and savior, renders them fit subjects of his kingdom, Eusebius. Um, then that purpose was to save people by that means. And the Sunday was put there as the sign of the power that was doing it instead of the Sabbath of the Lord, which signifies the Lord's power to do it. I read further on page 316. He commanded, too, that one day should be regarded as a special occasion for religious worship. And again, who else has commanded the nations inhabiting the continents and islands of this mighty globe to assemble weekly on the Lord's Day and observe it as a festival, not indeed for the pampering of the body, but for the comfort and invigoration of the soul by instruction in divine truth? And that is all it was set up for, to take the place of God, to take the place of the Sabbath of the Lord. It is appropriate enough that it should do so, because we have found if there is going to be another power that is going to save men, it has got to have another sign than God's to signify its power. It belongs there. That made the papacy that set up the government of the church and made the church the channel of salvation by absolute earthly power and compelling men into that way. Now we have read the doctrine of the church here, the doctrines of the church of Rome in the way that men must be saved. And it was altogether an, an altogether man's self. It was altogether the power of self alone that could save. And that is not the salvation of Christ. Her doctrines are that a man must fit himself good enough and the Lord would take him and make a regular bargain with him. If you will do so and so, then I will be good to you. And that is the record itself there in that book. I've not had, I, I have not time to read it tonight. Her doctrine is that man must do that, but there is not power in him to do it. But there is the argument. If he does it, then he gains all. That is not the salvation of Christ. That is not the salvation of God. Further than this, the professed Protestant churches of the United States have taken that same course now and have also exalted Sunday, the day that they place in this government, as the Catholic Church did in the Roman Empire and for the same purpose. Now, um, I want you to think about this a little bit. So Jones has gone through this. We've just been reading him at this point. And we have to go back to what he was talking about because he's coming back to... Um, what's happening with the World's Fair, the Chicago World's Fair in 1892. And so he says the professed Protestant churches of the United States have taken this course now. So this is the exaltation of Sunday. Now, when we talk about the Sunday law, for instance, uh, the pandemic that we have experienced, uh, we say it's a type of the Sunday law. What do we mean by that? Why is it a type of the Sunday law? Well, the government is demanding something that you do. Okay. Well, the government to, to your to your own body has something okay. to do with your own body. Okay. Yeah, but the government does that all the time. I mean that that doesn't necessarily make it a type of the Sunday law. So you well you, not not for your not for your own body. Not demanding put something in your body. Well, every time a government tries to control its populace. So when you have a tyranny, um, 
We don't say that's a type of the Sunday law. Right. So the question is, why does it make it a type? What is it that it's typical of? It's not so much that the government is just enforcing uh, unjust laws on it and, and taking away our constitutional rights. That's not what makes it a type of the Sunday law. It's part of it. They're trying to force you to choose, choose something. But it's choosing what? Well, choosing there's something against what's against your, um, you know, some people it's against their religion to, to get the jab or get vaccinations and, Okay, so so the issue here is is salvation, is it not? <clears throat> yeah, that's not talking in the spiritual sense, but it's talking in the physical sense, right? right? So so can we see that the reason it's a type of the Sunday law has to do with the fact that it is it is a type in the sense that this is symbolizing salvation even though it's a physical type of salvation and and what what is it that it's illustrating how is it illustrating um this this principle of a counterfeit because what is the true and what is the counterfeit we know with the sun, sunday sabbath issue the true is the sabbath that's that's god's mean for means for saving us from our sins and and the catholic church has this other way of saving us from our sins which is works right instead of the gospel so what is it counterfeiting because it's not counterfeiting the sabbath right Right. But it's counterfeiting the health message. Yes. We know the health message is the right arm of the gospel. Well, how is how is it that the health message is the right arm of the gospel? Because the gospel is about the Sabbath, right? We know that. If we are going to be healthy, how do we how do we become healthy? Is it about what we eat and about what we wear? Is it about um, how much we exercise, how much we spend? Taking taking care of your temple, taking care of the te temple okay. of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but how? Temple. But how do we do that? Because people could be uh, taking care of their body in, in lots of ways, but is that is that the health message alone? Not alone, no. Okay. So, so we know that one of the principles is trust in divine power. Now, when we look at um, uh, the Time of the End magazine, so the it first was being published in our firm foundation and, and started in January. So in January of uh, 1996, you're going to have the, the first article published. And in that issue, it's going to talk about new age medicine. Right. Because if, if for those of you who were studying when we examined the foundation. Oh, it does, huh? Now, does, does New Age medicine, does it consider the natural means of healing? Yeah. Well, uh, on the surface, it does, right? Yeah. See, I, sure. I grew up with New, New Age medicine, so, so I, I know quite a bit about it. All of these different ways in which we are to, uh, to trust in nature. So when we look at... Um, the contrast, if we wanted to, to try to contrast what we see about, you know, the health food industry compared to, uh, you know, the 
the pharmaceutical industry. Are they are they actually different or are they the same? Aren't they almost like two sides of the same coin? Okay, so explain. The pharmaceutical industry wants people to trust that what they are producing is for their good. Mm -hmm. The health food industry is producing highly um, <clears throat> foods foods that are not naturally occurring. Okay, I'm so say. okay, so so yeah, so they well to some degree there are natural things in, in the health but food industry, but they're very highly processed. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, but I don't know if that's the the main problem. I mean, if you're involved in, because the stuff that I grew up with, you know, my brother Dave was a hippie and he was, you know, had all, he had a huge library, which uh, ended up burning, but um, when his cabin burnt down, but uh, I read most of the books that he had and, and he had all kinds of bizarre books on every sort of imaginable um uh fad diet every sort of imaginable treatment for illness and which all purported to be natural but when it comes to healing we know that healing comes from god not from nature right that is the health food industry to a large degree is is new age right kind of like pantheism kind of in there right yeah it's um, it's, it's spiritualism right it, and yet, yeah spiritualism. and yet adventists often follow um and you know all kinds of things that are supposedly natural because they're against allopathic medicine um, but these things are really based on the same principles. The principles is that, you know, we can somehow heal ourselves. It's trusting in self. It's not about trusting God. Now, God, of course, created nature. So he has a means in which uh, he has created us to be able to heal through through the, the simple means that he has given in nature through herbs and so forth. But often people expect herbs to heal them when they're transgressing God's laws. So what, what is it when we, we can continually transgress God's laws of health and other things and expect that we can just be healed by the use of a few herbs or some kind of treatment? Is that the health message? No. 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 Is that the health message is a complete, uh, and I, I don't like the word lifestyle because it's not even just about a lifestyle. It's not about style. It's not, it's not some fad or fashion. It's no, actually it's a way of, it's a way exactly. of life. Yeah, but it's part, of, it's part of the gospel, right? It's cooperating yeah. with God in all things, obeying his laws, the laws of nature, the laws of health, as well as the law of God. It's trusting in God, not trusting in man, not trusting in ourselves, not trusting in our own works. So when we look at something that's a type of the Sunday law, it, it's only a type of the Sunday law in that it's addressing that part of the gospel, which we would call the health message. That is, it's a counterfeit. 
Now, but we know that the Sunday law is not about the health message. Can we agree on that? What was that again? Sorry. The Sunday law, the law is not about the health message. Right. That's not about it. Right. The Sunday law is about the Sunday. Now, we had, um, you know, Parminder and Tess saying that there wasn't going to be a Sunday law. And they, they tried to make the Sunday law about what? I don't remember. There. Well, it was basically human rights. Right? <clears throat> oh, I see. Yeah. Right. So... So they said, well, you know, the Sunday is sort of passe. We live in a, a different society, a different age. And so uh, this test is not actually going to be about Sunday in our time. That was just if it had happened in Ellen White's day. But we're in a different age and different time. We're in this other time of the end. And in our time of the end, it's not going to be about the Sunday. It's going to be about the principles of the Constitution of the United States. That's going to be the issue. And so it's going to be about human rights, the rights of, uh, you know, people to be uh, whatever gender they want to be, uh, for white people to recognize their privilege and that, uh, uh, you know, it's going to support Black Lives Matters. It's going to support the whole complete woke agenda. And, you know, CNN is going to be the source of truth. And so, so the problem there, of course, isn't really different. If you're going to say that the Sunday law is about, you know, the pandemic, and you're going to say that that's, that's going to be the issue, you know, whether somebody gets vaccinated or not, that's going to be the issue. That's going to be the test. Well, we can see that that's not the Sunday law. It can only be a type of the Sunday law because it's the sign of that authority. Doesn't mean that these other things can't be types of the Sunday law, but they can't be the Sunday law themselves. <clears throat> so, so when Joan starts, you know, talking here about the Sunday, um, I think this is something that really, that this movement hasn't really got its head around. Because we talk about the Sunday law, but we don't understand the principles behind it. Can a person pass the Sunday law? Can he pass the Sunday law test if he isn't, if he does not experience righteousness by faith? Can he have the sign and the seal of righteousness by faith if he hasn't experienced righteousness by faith? Does knowing about the Sunday and the Sabbath shield a person from uh, or protect a person in that time of the Sunday law? It's character. It's about character. But this character is something that comes from God, not something that comes from man. So Jones has shown that this is Christ's character. It's his righteousness, not man's righteousness, that's going to be seen upon his church. Now, it is righteousness indeed. It's not just some something where we have Christ's righteousness cover us, cover our sins, and, and we're not changed. Because then we wouldn't really have the sign... We wouldn't have the seal of God if we're not actually living righteous lives. His character to be seen upon us has to be in us. It's not just something that he covers us over with his garment of righteousness so that in the record books of heaven, we appear righteous when we're not actually righteous. He has to actually change us. Right. That's what we understand by righteousness, by faith. <clears throat> so 
so when the we have the Protestant churches of the United States are setting up an exalting Sunday, that has to happen to be a Sunday law. Correct? If it was true in Jones' day, it has to be true in our day. Okay, so he's going to go on. So keep this thought in the back of your mind as we read about the Sunday law here in Jones and really what the Sabbath represents. Uh, further than this, these professed Protestant churches know that there is no commandment given for that thing. They say that. They say that it began with the primitive church. And I do not care how far back they claim to get it in the primitive church. If it be a church institution, a church ordinance, that church commands men to perform, that the church commands men to perform, it is the same thing. It is the same evil thing. Because any church that would attempt to do it becomes in the nature of the attempt an apostate church. Trace it to the days of the apostles if you want to. Yet the church that did it is in the nature of things an apostate church, attempting to save itself and the others and others without the power of God. Therefore, whatever church did it, it is in the nature of things a fallen church because it is not the church's office in the world to command men. The church's office in the world is to obey God and not to command men. Any church, therefore, that presumes to command men is, at the very motion of it, an apostate church. The church that obeys God is the church of God. God commands. He is the power. His is the authority. He used the church, that through it he may reflect his power and his glory unto men. But the church has no right to command anybody. It obeys God alone, too. Now, I will put it I will put that in another way or state it in a little, a little more plainly. It is not the church's place to command anybody, and it is not the church's place to obey anybody, but God only. Now look at that a little further. The church as a whole, Catholic and apostate Protestant, has already put herself in the place of Jesus Christ. Because any church that exalts herself and makes herself the way of salvation is in that thing, an apostate church, and puts herself in the place of Jesus Christ, who is the Savior, don't you see? There is no church, then no church can exalt herself as a Savior of man. She may exalt Jesus Christ as the Savior of men, and Jesus Christ in her as the Savior of men, but not herself, because it is the same with the church as with individuals. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I have the presence of Jesus Christ dwelling in me. That is the word of the individual Christian. But the individual Christian cannot say, I am the Savior. The individual Christian cannot say, I am righteous, that I am good, and I have goodness to bestow upon others that they may be saved. No, the Christian can say, I have the righteousness of Christ. Christ dwells in me and sends in me and through me his blessed purpose in reaching others and saving them. But he is the Savior. He is the righteousness. He is the power. He is all and in all. As with the individual, so with the collection of individuals. As Christ dwells in the individual, so he dwells in the collection of individuals. In an additional sense beyond that which he dwells in the individual. And the righteousness of Christ in the collection of individuals is only the idea of the righteousness of Christ in a greater measure. If anything could be upon the collection of in individuals, which is the church, which would be like the body of Christ, right? So as Christ in the individual works through the individual to save, so Christ in the church works through the whole church to save. But if the church grows proud and thinks she is above all and begins to give herself credit for her glory and her power to save, she in that moment puts herself in the place of Jesus Christ as the Savior. And that is the same self-exaltation in the church that there is in the individual. And it was the self-exaltation in the individuals that made the self-exalted church and brought on the apostasy. Now then, that is the church putting herself forth as the way of salvation, as the Savior indeed, as the only, cha as the only channel of salvation 
and all must be saved in the way she lays down. And she thus exalted herself against God and against the prince of the host, against Jesus Christ, and set up that sign of her power to save against the sign which God set up. <coughs> and as we have found, she did it with the direct intent and purpose to put it in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord. And in the second apostate church, which that which has come in this land, she has done the same thing. She has, by a direct act of the government of the United States, the congressional action, put the Sunday institution, the sign of the power of the Church of Rome to save man. The professed Protestant churches have put that, by a direct congressional act, in this land, in the place of the Sabbath of the Lord, so that both mother and daughters have put the Sabbath of the Lord out of the way and have put the Catholic Church's sign of salvation in its place. Now let us see what that amounts to. What have we found the Sabbath is? The Sabbath we have found by every consideration is the sign of what Jesus Christ is to the believer, the sign of what God is, what God in Jesus Christ is to men, that it has in it the presence, the blessing, the spirit, the refreshing, the presence of Christ, which makes holy, and the presence of God, which sanctifies. It has in it the presence of Jesus Christ, and the man who keeps it by faith in Jesus has the presence of Jesus. And as each Sabbath day comes, he finds additional presence of Jesus. Then when that apostate church put that out of the way and put her own sign in its place, did she put only the day out of the way? voice she put the Christ, put christ out of the way was not that putting jesus christ away from the minds and lives of men when the apostate daughters have done the same thing in our land before our eyes have not they by that put away the presence and the power of christ and thus taken him away from the knowledge of men and from the lives of men congregation yes now it seems to me that there is a point there that is worth our consideration as to why it is that progress has not been made in Christian profession in the ages that are past, in the way Christ intended always that progress in Christian life should be made. What did he put into the life of man when he made him, even though he had remained faithful and never sinned, to carry him on in everlasting progress in the knowledge of God? In himself, what did he put there? Let me ask it over again now. When God made man at the beginning, put him here on the earth to live, if he had remained faithful forever and had never sinned, was there anything that God had put there and attached to him that could carry him on in an everlasting progress in the knowledge of God in his own heart's experience? And a voice from the congregation says, the Sabbath. Didn't we read it last night over and over? Didn't he put himself, his name, his living presence, his sanctifying power into the Sabbath day and give that to man? Although he was already blessed, although he was already glorified, so that when the blessed man came to that blessed day, he received additional blessing. Is not that so? Congregation, yes. Then has not God put into the world something that will? If observed, if kept as God chooses and intends, be something that will keep man, carry him onward in the channel of growth and progress in the knowledge of Jesus Christ in himself. What is that? Congregation, the Sabbath. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists, so we believe in the Sabbath. But what is the Sabbath in what Jones is presenting compared to how Adventists keep the Sabbath? What is the difference? You mean some Adventists they keep Yeah. Some some keep it correctly. I mean Well, yes, but but it's not just about the day, is it? No. Because only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. Right. This is about our complete life. You can't go through the week transgressing God's law and come to the Sabbath at sunset and keep the Sabbath. 
Can you? Well, you can try. <laughs> yeah. So you can stop working, you know, and and if you occupy yourself in enough religious activity, you might not even think about the worldly things, you know, that happen during the week. Um, but you still haven't kept the Sabbath. You can't go to the bar Friday night and then, you know, go to church Sabbath morning and believe you kept the Sabbath. You can't be drunk with the wine of this world and come to the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath. And yet we don't really understand what the Sabbath is about. We try not to do things that we think transgress the Sabbath. But God has given the Sabbath to man as a blessing to enter into fellowship with him as a sign that he is the one that sanctifies us. That righteousness comes from him. And yet, I would agree with Jones that most people, most Adventists, aren't actually keeping the Sabbath at all. Because you have the papal Sabbath, which is the Christian Sabbath, Sunday. You have the Jewish Sabbath, which is what most Adventists keep. But the Sabbath of the Lord is something different. It's not about the day. It is has to do with the day because the day is a sign but it is a sign that god is the one that sanctifies us so if god is not sanctifying us can we have the sign that god is sanctifying us if he isn't if i understand your question correctly the answer would be no yeah yeah because if god isn't sanctifying us because we're not submitting to god we can't have the sign of that sanctification, even if we keep the Sabbath in quotation marks, even if we don't work on Saturday and we attend church and, and we do all the right things. But if it's just us sanctifying ourselves, making ourselves righteous so that we can appear righteous, when inside we're full of dead man's bones, then it's not going to be a sign of sanctification that God is sanctifying us. And when it comes to the test, we will not be able to stand that test because we do not have a character that can stand that te test. And we will have all kinds of justifications for not keeping the Sabbath at the time it becomes a test because we've had all kinds of justifications for not obeying God in other things. And thinking that we are righteous. So Jones goes on. He says. It is there since man fell. Right. So the Sabbath is meant to be. Uh, something that God. To give us a blessing. His, to show his sanctifying work. So now then. When the church of Rome took the Sabbath away. From the minds of men. That by which they might be brought. To the recognition of Christ. And to the converting power of Christ. Was there anything there to carry them forward in the sanctifying work of Christ? That is the secret. Then you see why each church, starting out in the knowledge of God, salvation by faith and righteousness by faith, came to stand, came to a standstill. Then another church had to rise up and, re and um, reach righteousness by faith, salvation by faith, and come to a standstill. And oh, I, I, I think I read that wrong. Um, no, I read that right. Just don't quite understand what he's saying. Um, okay, and another one had to rise up and do the same thing and come to a standstill. Oh, I see what he's saying. So each of these churches rise up um, because God raises them up, but then they do the same thing, right? They start with the knowledge of God. But they come to a standstill. But when we came to this, the everlasting gospel is to be preached again. And the church is to rise up again at the last, which has that sign which brings the presence of Jesus Christ to men in his living presence, in a progressive work unto a completion. 
That is the church that has the Sabbath of the Lord. The church which has the Sabbath of the Lord is brought to that completed work in the salvation of Christ. So if we think about this in the context of this movement, we have a church that's raised up at the end. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists, right? There is not to be another church, so to speak. But has the Seventh-day Adventist church um, done exactly what Jones has said? Have they come to a standstill? Heidi says yes. So what is the church going to do in the end? Are they going to stand on the side of the Sabbath or on the side of the Sunday? They're going to stand on the side of Sunday. Right. We know that from the spirit of prophecy. Now, individuals within the church will stand for the Sabbath. But I know that, that and I've said this other times before, but, you know, there are Adventists think, that think you need to stay with the ship. But if we think about it, if the church keeps the Sabbath, will the church as an institution survive in the time of the Sunday law? No. No, it can't possibly. Because as we saw what happened in 2017 in the Soviet Union, well, not Soviet Union, Russia, uh, with the Jehovah's Witnesses who wouldn't obey uh, the laws that were restricting their religious freedom, they lost their churches. The Adventist church didn't, though, because it compromised with the state. It complied to the rules so it could keep its churches. But if it had stood for the gospel, it would, it would have lost its churches. So if the church stands for the truth, for the Sabbath, it will lose its institutions, its schools, its hospitals, its churches, correct? Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so the church can't possibly, as an institution, survive the Sunday law unless it, it complies with the Sunday law. But if it complies with the Sunday law, then it's, it's going to be on the wrong side of the issue. And you wouldn't want to stay with that church. Right? It'd be apostate Protestantism. Right. So the church is going to have its reasons why it does this. And many Adventists will go along with these reasons of why they're going to observe Sunday. And they will misuse scripture and spirit of prophecy quotes to do so. But the issue is going to be the Sabbath. Are we going to keep the Sabbath of the Lord or not? Then who can measure? Who but the mind of God could possibly measure the iniquity? And the evil that has been done to the world by that fearful thing that the apostate church has done. None but the mind of God can comprehend the mischief and the loss that has been wrought in the world by that thing. Well, then, the effect of that was to take away the presence of Christ, take Christ away from the knowledge, the heart's experience of men, and put another to put a human power, a satanic power, to put self in the place of God and in the place of Christ, who emptied himself that God might appear. Now, here is a historical parallel, so apt and so perfect that I read it. First, mankind altogether, as men, uh, without any church at all, are subject to God. Can they exist without him? Congregation, no. And if any man by his own act could indeed become independent of God, could he exist? Congregation, no. What did Satan start out to do in the first place? Was it not to become independent of God, self-existent? And if he could have accomplished his purpose, what would it have been? Voice, his destruction. Bound to be, because he could not exist without him who created him. But in his wild ambition, in his intense all-absorbing selfishness, 
He thought he could live without God who created him. Is not that the same thought in this self-exaltation that has put itself in the place of God? Well, whether it be man as man or men professedly as Christians organized into a church, they're equally dependent upon God and God in Jesus Christ, and they are subject to the law of God. The law of God is the supreme law. The law of God is the government of his whole universe, and everybody on the earth is subject to that law. Now, see the parallel. About 260 years ago, Ireland had home rule, as she is after it now. And she had a parliament of her own, governing her own internal affairs and the affairs of Ireland. But she was subject to the supreme government in England. Now, I read from the fifth volume of Macaulay's History of England, page 301, of this particular edition, chapter 23. However, if you have any other editions, you can find it in that chapter. Now, notice. The Irish lords and commons had presumed not only to reenact an English act passed expressively for the purpose of binding them, but to reenact it with alterations. The alterations were indeed small, but the alterations even of a letter was tantamount to a declaration of independence. Now, is the law of God enacted to bind the church as well as every other man? Congregation, yes. Has that apostate church presumed to alter the law? Congregation, yes. The alteration of it in a single letter would be what? Voice, the Declaration of Independence. She has altered it more than a single letter in the actual thought, in the very idea, in the very thing that reveals and brings the presence of God above every other part of the law. She has taken him out of it. Then what has she done? Congregation, put herself there. She has established her own independence of God and proclaimed it to the world. The Protestant churches, professedly Protestant, not Protestant any longer, the professed Protestant churches have drawn the Congress of the United States into the same identical position. They have drawn the Congress of the United States into a reenactment of the Fourth Commandment, haven't they? Congregation, yes. It was quoted bodily and put upon the statute book of legislation, Government Patterson the other day in Pennsylvania speaking in the capital of that state, arguing in behalf of Sunday laws that are already in the statutes books, says that this law is only part of that system of the law of God, which is reenacted in the statutes of Pennsylvania. He says that the law of God there is reenacted. But did they reenact the law of God as it is? Congregation, no. To do that, to undertake to enforce it, would put themselves on an equality with God, but they reenacted it with alterations. And that puts them above God. And the churches of this nation have proclaimed themselves independent of God in the act which they have taken of setting up his own law and then deliberately altering it in the course of the legislation which set, which set it up. Let me read another sentence from Macaulay's History of England from the same page as before. The colony in Ireland was therefore emphatically a dependency. A dependency not merely by the common law of the realm, but by the nature of things. It was absurd to claim independence for a community which could not cease to be dependent without ceasing to exist. Was there ever a more complete parallel on earth to illustrate in the place of government and government law this principle? than that, that which occurred there and was recorded for our instruction. Now a thought. Jesus Christ came into the world himself, didn't he? Congregation, yes. He made the Sabbath himself, didn't he? Congregation, yes. He was Lord of the Sabbath himself, wasn't he? Yes. He knew and he alone the true idea of the Sabbath, didn't he? Yes. Yet he did things on the Sabbath, carrying out the true idea of the Sabbath, which did not suit the ideas of the priests and Pharisees and the politicians of that day, didn't he? Congregation, yes. And that stirred up their hatred against him. The thing that did stir up their hatred against him was that very thing, that more than anything else, he disregarded their ideas of the Sabbath. Isn't that so? Yes. And their hatred put him out of the world for that reason more than any other under the sun, that he disagreed with their ideas of the Sabbath. 
they did it. In the fourth century, there was another apostate church disagreeing with God's idea of the Sabbath. And they put the Sabbath and him with it out of their minds and out of the world as far as their power could go. The other put him out of the world, but he came back again. And they put him out only so far as their power was concerned. That is all. Here's another apostate church, a third one, following the example of the other apostate, two which have gone before. It has put him in his Sabbath out of the world because their ideas of the Sabbath disagree with his. And they will not submit to his. That is a fact. You know that it is a fact. In order that the original apostate church might accomplish her purpose in putting him out of the world and thus maintain their ideas of what the Sabbath is, they join themselves to an earthly power. They join themselves to Caesar and turn their backs upon God. That was done. In the second apostasy of the church, that she might accomplish her purpose of putting him in his Sabbath out of the world, she joined herself to Caesar, likewise to accomplish her purpose. In the third apostasy, in order that these also may carry their idea of the Sabbath against Christ's idea of the Sabbath, they must put him in his Sabbath out of their way. But in order to accomplish it, they must join themselves again to the powers of earth, again to Caesar, as the others did before them. In the first apostasy, when they join them, themselves to Caesar in order to get rid of him and sustain their ideas of what the Sabbath is against him. The result of that, although it was accomplished by a mere minority, a very small minority, in fact, so small that they did not dare to let the people know that what they were about for fear they would rescue him out of their hands entirely. That minority, small as it was, was composed most largely and was led entirely by leaders of the church. And these leaders of the church, by threats, compelled the representatives of Caesar's authority, by their threats, to yield to their ideas and execute their will. You know they did it. That is the record. That was the utter ruin of that nation, wasn't it, congregation? Yes. It is possible then, is it, for a minority, very small minority, led by even a minority of the church managers, but the leading ones, to take a course that will ruin the nation of which they are a part. Congregation, yes. When we come to the second apostasy, apostasy, they did the same things again by trading off their influence to worldly power and by this means get governmental power in their hands to accomplish their purpose of putting Christ in his Sabbath out of their way and maintaining their own ideas of the Sabbath against his. That was done by the minority. It was done by the chief leaders of the church, and but a few at that. What was the result of that intrigue in the empire of Rome? It was its utter ruin. Then it is possible that a minority, a very small minority, insignificant as compared to the great mass, led though by, by a few of the church prelates, I say it is possible for such a, a few as that to establish a system of things and take the course and put the government into such a course of work as will prove its utter ruin that has been demonstrated twice in history. Then in this land, last year, before your eyes and mine, a minority of the people of this country, led by a few, a minority only of the church leaders, did, by threats, bring the politicians to surrender the power of government into their hands to accomplish their purpose of sustaining their ideas of the Sabbath against Christ's idea of the Sabbath. It has been demonstrated twice in history that such an act as this ruined the nation in which it was done. Does that double demonstration mean anything in the third instance? Congregation, yes. The lesson that is taught in both instances will be felt in the third instance. It means that ruin and nothing but ruin can come of it. They themselves cannot prevent it. It cannot be done. They have set a going, a train of circumstances that nothing in the universe can stop. That is fixed. Now, this Congress is about to expire. It is altogether likely from the whole situation that it will expire without touching the question further. If the next Congress should repeal it outright, it would not affect the situation and the results. That thing has started and it will will go on in spite of everything they can ever do. 
you and I need not be surprised that if it be not repealed by the next Congress, that it will be repealed someday. And when that day comes, then that every Sabbath keeper on the earth rise up with all vigor that the spirit of God can give him cut loose from everything on earth and put it into the cause of God. For in but a little while, the tide will swing back and take all with it to ruin. You and I need not be surprised that it, that, that may come. When it comes, that will be the meaning of it. But those who have not had an experience in the cause of God will mistake the meaning of it. And they will say to you, we told you all the time that you were making too much out of that. There was nothing in it. And so they will settle back. When the tide swings back, they are caught in ruin. Let not your minds and your hearts be deceived by anything of that kind, even though it should come twice. You believe it. Believe what is being said here. Study it for your lives, for your lives are in it. Bear in mind that that which has been done means in itself exactly what these two previous lessons teach. It means ruin, though there might be the repeals once or twice. The tide is set and the result of that follows in spite of anything that the universe can do. Then it is no difference what a man tells you. You tell him you know better. No difference if Congress undoes it. You tell them that that is the surest reason that the thing is that much nearer than ever and put your whole soul into it. If he laughs at you, God has promised that the day will come, that you will laugh and he will mourn. It is dangerous business. Well, then, these are some of the things. We will call your attention to other things at another time. Now, then the question as to whether the Sabbath, the seventh day, the Sabbath of the Lord, is the, is the day, or Sunday is the day, has considerable meaning in it. It means more than anyone on the earth has yet dreamed. Unless taken personally into the counsels of God. Further than that, let us look at it. We have found that the Sabbath is the sign of the power of God in Jesus Christ, working the salvation of men. We have found that the Sabbath brings by itself and in itself the presence of Jesus Christ into the living experience of a man as nothing else can, and it keeps it and keeps it there. That is a fact. And if you have not found it out in your own experience, you believe it. And you will find it in your own experience. Everyone may know who will believe. Well, then, we have found that the attempt in that was to take the Lord away from the knowledge of man. That has been demonstrated. Now, upon that question, then, as to whether the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord or not, hangs man's salvation. That is settled. Upon that question hangs their salvation or their destruction now. There are instances of that kind. Let us turn and read it. And with that thought, we will close for this time. Acts 25, 19 and 20. But had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matter, matters. There was a great question to be made to make such an uproar that that was a great question to make such an uproar about as to whether a man was dead or alive. Here, the whole Jewish nation was stirred up against one of their own people. And all the question that was involved was as to whether one was dead or alive. That is what Festus saw in it. But you and I know upon whether that person was dead or alive depend the salvation or the perdition of the whole world. You know, that is so. And the same thing is asked today. What is the use of all this stir about whether it is Saturday or Sunday, about the keeping of the day? Why it is only a day anyhow? What is the use of getting up a new sect, a new denomination, and making a great stir? What is the use of making all that stir about it, whether Sunday is the Sabbath or another day, whether we rest on one day or another? Never mind as to whether that day is the Sabbath or not. Upon the decision of that by men as individuals and as bodies depends the salvation or the destruction of this earth today. That's settled. Whether that day is the Sabbath of the Lord or not, upon that hangs the salvation of men today as it did back there that day. Those people in their envy against Christ and determination to maintain 
their own idea against God's idea. They got him out of the world, and then they got up a controversy as to whether he was dead or alive. So these same people will put the Sabbath out of the world and then raise up a question as to whether it is the Sabbath or not. They know well enough it is the Sabbath. But like those back there, they will ma maintain their own ideas of the Sabbath against God's idea. And though he has told them that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, just as certainly as that was so in that question, in that question depended the salvation of man. Just so certainly today on this question depends the salvation of man. Because we can boldly say boldly that the salvation of men does depend and does hang upon their keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord, because the keeping of the Sabbath of the Lord has the presence of Jesus Christ, his life, and man cannot be saved without it. So I say again, we may boldly say that the salvation of man depends upon his own observance of the Sabbath of the Lord as it is in Jesus Christ. For that means Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ means the Sabbath, and the Sabbath means Jesus Christ. In this day, when men are enlightened upon it, when the message of the everlasting gospel is to be preached to the world, when the third angel's message is to go to them with Christ in it, and Christ the all and all of it, then they also that reject the Sabbath of the Lord may turn their backs upon Christ, and they themselves know that there's no salvation in that way. But haven't we in our previous study seen that there is nothing else <clears throat> to preach to men in this world but Jesus Christ and him alone? That is the only thing. And haven't we seen that we are to preach him in the face of every earthly consideration, every consideration of protection of earthly powers, every consideration of wealth, or influence of any kind, and life itself. That is in the message of, to the world. Christ is the message to the world. Christ has made known in the Sabbath of the Lord, which is a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God, and my name is I am what I am. So... It's, it's, this message has a lot to think about it. I mean, one thing that we, we can consider is, do we really understand what the Sabbath is about? Do we really understand that it's not just about stopping work on Friday and going to church? That there's something more that we, we haven't experienced Christ needs to be in each one of us. I don't know if I could explain it better than Jones has. But it is something for us to think about. Any final thoughts on what jo Jones has said? The one thought I have when I when I look at my experience as an Adventist, um, well, the Adventists I knew when I became an Adventist, they did talk a lot about the Sabbath and about the Antichrist and about the Catholic Church and the papacy. And their focus was upon how much better they are than those people who keep Sunday. But is that the gospel? Absolutely not. If in our meetings, all we can do is talk about how other people are so bad or don't understand things the way that we do, has the gospel really had an effect upon us? No. The message that, that we have been studying, the messages that we've been studying in this movement have been bringing a strong conviction that we are much farther from God than we like to admit. 
that we do very little of what God asks us to do. We do what, what we think needs to be done just to maintain some kind of pretense that we are truly converted. But we know deep inside that we are far from God. What God wants to do in us is something more than we can even ask or think. It's Christ dwelling in us. It's not something that we can produce. It's something we have to allow God to do. He's not going to do it against our will. And itself is the only thing that has hindered him from doing it so far. These, these next uh, few um, sermons are extremely powerful. Um, so now we have a study tomorrow morning and Dwight's going to be presenting again. And then Stephen's going to be presenting with the Canadian group. And what we need to, to recognize um, it's not so much what we see in other people, but what we see in ourselves and, and the contrast between who Christ is and how we see ourselves. Anyway, I look forward to tomorrow, uh, for the studies tomorrow. But for now, we need to close with prayer. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please. Continue to bless us with the light that you have given us. Help us not to reject that light, to set it aside. We pray for each person. We know, Lord, that we all are struggling in this world of sin. We just ask that somehow you can perform a miracle in our lives, that you can break down those barriers that, you, that we can open the door of our hearts to let Christ in. Thank you for the Sabbath. We know it is a sign between you and us that you are the ones that sanctify us. And we ask that this work can be done. Help us to cooperate, to yield to that work. Be with each person watching these videos. And use us to your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.